Primary bombers were the Heinkel HE-111, Donaire DO-17, and Junkers Ju-88. Junkers Ju-88 for level bombing at medium to high altitudes, and the Junkers Ju-87 Stuka for dive bombing tactics. The HE-111 was used in greater numbers than the others during this during this conflict, and uh, was better known partly due to its distinctive uh, wing shape. Each level bomber had a few reconnaissance versions uh, accompanying them that were used during the battle. Although it had been successful in previous Luftwaffe engagements, the Stuka suffered heavy losses in the Battle um, of Britain, particularly on 18th of August due to its slow speed and vulnerability to fighter interception after dive bombing a target. After the losses uh, went up along with the, their limited payload and range, Stuka units were largely removed from the operations over England and diverted to concentrate on shipping instead uh, until they were eventually redeployed to the Eastern Front in 1941 against the Russians. For some raids, they were called back, such as on September 13th uh, to attack uh, Dengmare Airfield. Uh, the remaining three bomber types uh, deferred in their capabilities. The Donaire uh, DO-17 was the slowest and had the smallest bomb load, um, definitely underpowered. The Ju-88, which was the fastest um, once its mainly external bomb load was dropped, the, and the HE-111 had the largest internal bomb load. All three bomber types suffered heavy losses from uh, the home-based British fighters. But the Ju-88 had significantly lower lo loss rates due to its greater speed and its ability to dive out of trouble. It was originally designed as a dive bomber. The German bombers required constant protection by the Luftwaffe's fighter force. German escorts uh, were not significantly numerous. Um, BF-109E Messerschmitts were ordered to support more than three to 400 bombers on any given day. Later in the conflict, when night bombing became more frequent, all three were used. Due to its smaller bomb load, the lighter DO-17 was used less than the HE-111 and Ju-88 for this purpose. The Heinkel HE-111 was a German bomber aircraft designed by Siegfeld and Walter Gunther, uh, Gunther at Heinkel um, uh, Flugzeugwerk sorry, in 1934. Though developed, uh, though development was described as uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, due to restrictions placed on Germany after the First World War prohibiting bombers, uh, it masqueraded as a civil airliner. Although from conception, the design was intended to provide the nascent Luftwaffe with a, me a fast medium bomber, and that's what it was designed for and used. The Ju-88, despite uh, pro protracted development, it became one of the Luftwaffe's most important aircraft. The assembly line ran constantly from 1936 to 1945, and more than 15,000 Ju-88s were built in dozens of variants, more than any other twin-engine German aircraft of the period. Throughout production, the, the basic structure of the aircraft remained unchanged. Here it is again. It's the, one of their most most lethal bombers, um, certainly on a on a power power field. The Do seventeen. And it was a, of course a light bomber of Nazi Germany during the Second World War. It was produced by Cordes um, uh, Donner's company, Donner Flagzenwerk. The aircraft was designed as a, a, shell, a snail bomber, fast bomber, a light bomber, which in theory would be so fast that it could outrun defending fighter aircraft. Um, the Donair was designed with two engines mounted on a shoulder wing structure and possessed a twin, uh, twin tail fin configuration. The type was popular among its crews due to its handling, especially at low altitude, which made the Donair 17 hot, uh, harder to hit than uh, other German bombers. Designed in the early 30s, it was one of the, the three main Luftwaffe bomber types, 
um, used in, a, in the first three years of the war. Of course, it made its combat debut in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War, operating in the Condor Legion in various roles. Along with the Heinkel HE 111, it was the main bomber type of the, uh, the German air arm 1939 1940. The Donaires uh, was used throughout, throughout the early war and saw action in significant numbers in every major campaign theater as a frontline aircraft until the end of 1941 when its effectiveness and use in usage was curtailed as its bomb load and range were limited of course um, it had, and of course it was underpowered um, wasn't able to uh, wasn't didn't have the bomb capacity for what it was intended to do certainly in the Battle of Britain um, <clears throat> It's the in theory would be so fast it could defend it, uh, but it a lot of losses. It took a lot of losses during um, in the Battle of Britain. On the British side, three bomber types were mostly used on night operations against targets such as factories, invasion ports, and railway centers. The Armstrong um, Whiteworth Whitney, uh, the Hanley, Page, Hampton, and the Vickers Wellington were classified as heavy bombers by the RAF, although the Hampton was a medium bomber comparable to the HE 111. Uh, the twin engine um, Bristol Blindham and, oh, uh, and, <clears throat> and the obsolescent single engine um, Ferry Battle, Ferry Battle were both light bombers, and the Blindham was the most numerous of the aircraft equipped uh, equipping RAF bomber command at the time of the Battle of Britain and was used in attacks against shipping ports airfields and factories on the continent uh, by day and by night the ferry battle squadrons which had suffered heavy losses in daylight attacks during the Battle of France were brought up to strength with reserve aircraft and continued to operate at night in attacks against the invasion ports um, until the battle was withdrawn from the UK front line um, until until the battle was from the UK front line service in October 1940 sorry um, so <clears throat> these took heavy losses but were brought so these were some of the three bomber aircraft that um, that I had here and uh, so I will talk more about them and um, so the W the AW 38 Whitney was uh, or sorry Whitley was one of the three British twin-engine frontline bomber aircraft types that were in service with the Royal Air Force RAF and the during the outbreak of the Second World War Alongside the Vickers Wellington and the Handley Page Hamden, the, Whit the Whitley was developed during the mid 30s, according to Air Ministry Specification B3 34, which it was subsequently selected to meet. Of course, it was certain speed, uh, certain, um, certain range, and uh, carry a certain bomb load. Um, in 1937, the Whitley form formally entered the uh, into RAF squadron service. It was um, the first of the three medium bombers to be introduced. So uh, the HP-52 Hamden was a, a British twin-engine bo medium bomber of the Royal Air Force. Um, it was part of the trail of large twin-engine bombers procured by for the uh, the Royal Air Force, joining uh, the the Whiteworth Whitley uh, and the Vickers Wellington, the newest of the three medium bombers. The Hamden was often referred to to, to by air crews as the flying suitcase because it uh, because of its cramped crew conditions. The Hamden uh, the Hampton was powered by Bristol Pegasus radial engines, but a variant known as the uh, Handley Page Hereford had inline um, Napier Daggers engines, which are so. Um, a different with a different variant of the aircraft. 
So this is more about Canada's effort. And Canada put an effort along with Poland and uh, Czechoslovakian um, ex-pilots that had been pushed into France and then escaped um, on the ships during um, operation operations at uh, Dunkirk and <clears throat> then the miniature operation at Dunkirk which is you know 15 days later um, in which many British of course British Belgian and uh, some French soldiers were able to um, flee to Great Britain um, also a number of Polish and um, as well as Czechoslovakian and um, even uh, uh, Belgian pilots uh, a number numerous pilots from other countries that have been already been conquered were able to come to England and actually fight with the Royal Air Force and of course Canada's effort Canada has always been so close to England of course being we're being part of the Commonwealth um, being a part of the British Empire, we played a major a pivotal role in um, England's defense during the Second World War and including the Battle of Britain. Uh, from the mid-1930s with the, the, the tacit support of the federal government in Canada and help from the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force, Canada had been a good source for RAF recruits for both flying and non-flying positions. The country was uh, emerging from the economic chaos of the Great Depression, of course, and had only a small uh, domestic air force. So Canadians seeking adventure or just a steady av aviation job turned to the RAF in ever increasing numbers. Uh, the, collectively, these Canadians in the RAF became known as Can RAF. Uh, so Canadian RAF. It's est estimated that more than 1,800 of them served in the British flying services during the entire war number 242 squadron so in October 1939 primarily to encourage additional recruiting and as a public relations initiative number 242 squadron Canadian squadron was formed with the R within the RAF commanding commanded by squadron leader Fowler um, Ga Gobel um, Gobel and he was an RAF, or, sorry, RCAF pilot on exchange with the with the RAF. All but one of the squadron's pilots, and up to forty percent uh, of its ground crew were Can RAF personnel. So that way, he was commanded, and Fowler was in command of this unit. Um, it would be the largest grouping of Canadians um, in the air battles to come until the arrival of the RCAF Number One Squadron in June 1940 just before the Battle of Britain. So except uh, um, except for fighting uh, over Norway, combat between the RAF and Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, uh, had been sporadic until 10th of May 1940. But on that date, the German invasion of the Netherlands, France and Belgium, brought, and of course Luxembourg, brought the RAF and Luftwaffe into violent conflict. By the time France fell to Germany on 22nd, June 1940, uh, the British had lost 1,029 aircraft and 1,500 aircrew, many of whom were Canadian. Committed uh, piecemeal to France um, in late May, number 242 Squadron had was actively engaged throughout this period. Squadron leader uh, Gobel claimed the first RCAF aerial victory on 25th May. By the time the squadron was withdrawn to England on 18th of June uh, to rest and rebuild, the number of casualties and their subsequent replacement by British pilots meant that, for all practical purposes, the unit was Canadian in name only. Many losses. So the number one fighter squadron, alarmed by the possibility of Britain's defeat, the Canadian government sent it's only hurricane-equipped uh, unit number one fighter squadron to England on 8th of June. As a sign of how small the RCAF was in 1940, the squadron had to be brought up to wartime strength by amalgamating it with flying and ground personnel from um, number 115th City of Montreal squadron prior to departure. Two other RCAF flying units 
had already been sent to England. Number 110 and 112 Army Cooperate oh, oh I'm sorry, um, Army Cooperation Squadrons. <clears throat> and although they did not take an active part in the Battle of Britain, they did serve as a source of replacement pilots. Um, arriving in England on uh, 21st, 20th, 21st June, number one squadron immediately uh, embarked on a period of intensive training to bring it up to combat standards. So, in these combat standards, uh, under the British, uh, the Royal Air Force, they wanted to bring up their standards uh, in time for the fighting. Operation Sea Line. If you know of Operation Sea Line, this is the operation, of course, where an amphibious landing, uh, a sudden landing, would be um, the plan, was the plan for Hitler to launch the first invasion. Um, the invasion of England is the first strike for a land, for a land invasion. Um, Operation Sea Lion, also written as Operation Sea Lion, um, was Nazi Germany's code name for the, for the plan for the invasion of the United Kingdom during the Battle of Britain. Of course, following the uh, fall of France, Hitler and Hitler um, and supreme in his supreme command, the OKD, uh, hoped the British government would seek a peace agreement, and he reluctantly considered uh, invasion only as a last resort if all other options failed. However, once Hitler had determined that Germany would invade the Soviet Union uh, in 1941, a desire. A, des a desirability of forcing Britain out of the war before that date increased the attractiveness of an invasion as potentially offering a quick, uh, decisive victory in the West. As a precondition, Hitler uh, specified the achievement of both air and naval superiority over the English Channel and the proposed landing sites, but the German forces did not achieve either, either at any point uh, during the war. And both the German high command and Hitler himself had serious doubts about the prospects for success. Nevertheless, both the German army and navy undertook a major program of preparations for an invasion, training troops, developing specialized weapons and equipment, and modifying transport vessels. A large number of uh, river barges, transport ships were gathered together on the, the Channel coast but with Luftwaffe aircraft losses increasing in the Battle of Britain and no sign that the Royal Air Force had been defeated, Hitler postponed Operation Sea Line indefinitely on the 17th of September 1940, and it was never put into action. So this is Operation Sea Line as it would play out. So you have uh, Army Group B and Army Group A and amphibious landings here, and of course uh, paratrooper landings, airborne landings here, Near Brighton, and here, uh, no Folkestone, and that would be pushing uh, near, near Lyme Regis, and then into Bristol, and then Gloucester, and surrounding London. This was never to happen. So here's another picture of it. The Sixth Army was to go onto the left, onto the west, in at Lyme Regis, Bristol, Gloucester. The Ninth Army, at, leaving from uh, Le, Le Havre, would go to Ventnor and Portsmouth, and push on and uh, and Bright, and uh, split off and go to Brighton, and where there would be uh, airborne landings, and then push on to London. And of course, the Ninth would be tasked with. Um, encircling London and taking Oxford, taking Oxford, and and then of course subsequently hitting of course London, uh, and of course the 16th Army from Calais, uh, Boulogne, Calais, and from Dunkirk and Ostend would go to uh, Ramsgate and into Rochester, and of course to London. So there's multiple points there where they would encircle London, and then go on to Malden. So and then Army Group, so Army Group A, Army Group C, and of course these armies here 
I would all play a pivotal role. And these would be, the, of course, this is the beachheads. The beachheads at Dover, Ramsgate, Bexhill, uh, and Brighton. Okay, so that's this was never put into action. This is uh, the plan for Operation Sea Lion. Before the war, the RAS processes for selecting uh, potential candidates were opened to men of all social classes through the creation of, in 1936 of the RAF Volunteer Reserve, which was designed to appeal to young men without any class uh, designate, uh, distinctions. Mm -hmm. Older squadrons of the Royal Auxiliary Air Force did re retain some of their upper class exclusiveness, but their numbers were soon swamped by the newcomers of the RAF VR. By September uh, 1st, 1939, 6,646 pilots had been trained through the RAF VR. So that's the volunteer force. Um, <clears throat> So they were swamped by many members from multiple fields and uh, multiple poor, rich and poor. By mid-1940, there were uh, about 9,000 pilots in the RAF to man about 5,000 aircraft, most of which were bombers. Fighter command was never short of pilots, but the problem of finding significant numbers of fully trained fighter pilots became acute by mid-August uh, mid 1940, uh, losing numerous pilots and aircraft. With aircraft production running at 300 planes each week, only 200 pilots were trained at the in the same period. And that at that point, as I had mentioned, um, the they were producing more fighters than the Germans were at the time, and producing them faster. In addition, more pilots were uh, allocated to squadrons than there were aircraft, as this allowed squadrons to maintain operational strength uh, despite casualties and still provide for pilot leave. Another factor was that only 30% of the 9,000 pilots were assigned to operational squadrons. 20% of the pilots were involved in conducting pilot training. And a further 20% were undergoing further instruction. Like those offered in Canada and in southern uh, Rhodesia, to the Commonwealth trainees, although already qualified. <clears throat> the rest were assigned to staff positions since RAF policy dictated that only pilots could make uh, many staff and operational command decisions, even in engineering matters. At the height of fighting, and despite Churchill's insistence, only 30 pilots were released to the front line from administrative duties. For these reasons, and the permanent loss, loss of 435 pilots during the Battle of France uh, alone, along with many more wounded and others lost in Norway, the RAF had fewer experienced pilots at the start of the initial defense of their home. It was the lack of trained pilots <clears throat> in the fighting squadrons, rather than the lack of aircraft, that became the greatest concern for Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding, Commander of Fighter Command. Drawing from regular RAF forces, the Auxiliary Air Force and the Volunteer Reserve, the British were able to muster some 1,103 fighter pilots on 1st of July, replacing pilots, uh, replacement pilots with little flight training and often no gunnery training, uh, suffered heavy, uh, high and high casualty rates. Um, thus, uh, exacerbating the problem. The Luftwaffe, on the other hand, were able to muster a large number, larger number, 1,450 of the more experienced fighter pilots. Drawing from a cadre uh, of Spanish Civil War veterans, these pilots already had comprehensive courses in aerial gunnery and instructions in tactics suited for fighter versus fighter combat. Training manuals uh, discouraged heroism, stressing the importance of attacking only when the odds were in the pilot's favor. Despite the high levels of experience, German fighter formations did not provide a significant reserve of pilots uh, to allow for losses and leave. <clears throat> and the Luftwaffe was unable to produce enough pilots to prevent a decline in operational strength 
as the battle progressed. Here's one of the hurricanes here. So, pilots of the Polish 303 Squadron, and that's the hurricane, as you can see behind. This is actually from one of the most uh, recent movies that have come out. There's one uh, um, 303 Squadron, and there's one that's in Polish. Uh, there's a couple of them that have come out in the last number of years. About 20% of pilots who took part in the battle were from non-British countries. The Royal Air Force Roll of Honor for the Battle of Britain recognizes 595 non-British pilots out of 2,936 as flying at least one authorized operational sortie with an eligible unit of the RAF or Fleet Air Arm between 10th of July and the 31st of October 1940. These include 145 Poles from 303 Squadron, um, 127 New Zealanders, 112 Canadians, 88 Czechoslovaks, 10 Irish, 32 Australians, and 28 Belgians, 25 South Africans, and 13 French, 9 Americans, 3 Southern Rhodesians, and individuals from Jamaica, uh, Barbados, and even Newfoundland, before it was one of our provinces, of course. Altogether, in the fighter battles, um, the bombing raids and the various patrols flown between 10th of July to 31st of October 1940 by the Royal Air Force, 1,495 aircrew were killed, of whom 449 were fighter, fighter pilots, 718 aircrew from Bomber Command, and 280 from Coastal Command. Among those killed were 47 airmen from Canada, 24 from Australia, 17 from South Africa, and 35 from Poland, 20 from Czechoslovakia, 6 from Belgium. 47 New Zealanders lost their lives, including 15 fighter pilots, 20, 24 bomber, and 8 coastal air crew. The names of these Allied and Commonwealth airmen are inscribed in a memorial book, uh, which rests in the Battle of Britain Chapel in Westminster Abbey. In the, chap in the chapel, is a stained glass window which contains the badges of the fighter squadrons which operated during the battle and the flags of the nations to which the pilots and air crew belonged. These pilots, some of whom had to flee their home countries because of German invasions, fought with distinction. The number 303 squadron, fought Polish fighter squadron, for example, was not just the highest scoring of hurricane squadron, but also had the highest ratio of enemy aircraft destroyed relative to their own losses. Amazing. Had it not been for the magnificent material uh, distributed, uh, or sorry, contributed by the Polish squadrons and their unsurpassing gallantry, wrote Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowden, head of uh, RAF Fighter Command, I hesitate to say that the outcome of the battle would, wouldn't have been the same. So to them, certainly, they were a massive help. Number 303 Squadron was based at RAF uh, Northolt from uh, 2nd of August 1940 and became operational on 31st of August. Its initial cadre was 13 officer and 8 NCO pilots and 135 Polish ground, ground staff. At the outset, serving RAF uh, officers were appointed to serve as CO. SLDRRG Kellett and, and Flight Commanders FLKA Kent and F uh, Flight Sorry um, Flight Lieutenant uh, J A Kent and Flight Lieutenant A S Forbes alongside the Poles, as the Polish pilots were unfamiliar with RAF Fighter Command language procedures and training. <clears throat> sorry, Squadron Leader R G Kellett. Right. Sorry. Um, reading things in, in slow. The nickname chosen by the squadron was in honor of the famous 18th century Polish American general uh, Tadeusz Kosciuszko. Uh, Kosciuszko. Number 303 Squadron was also uh, 
linked to the original 1919 Kokosko Eskedro, which uh, through personnel um, that had served in that squadron, um, and that's what, of course, linked to that original, so an original squadron. Later, further Air Force units from this unit were renamed the 7th, uh, 121st, and 111th uh, Eskadrils of the Polish Air Force. As the Battle of Britain wore on the, and the shortage of trained pilots became critical, the exiles were uh, uh, accepted into RAF squadrons and two Polish fighter units, numbers uh, 302 and 303 squadrons, were formed. Um, once committed into to action, the Poles flew and fought uh, superbly, shooting down 203 enemy aircraft for the losses of 29 pilots killed. Wow. <clears throat> and that's um, these are this is a unit that I've recognized for a number of years uh, of the hurricane is a superb aircraft and it certainly made its debut in this squadron certainly um, number three three squadron became the most successful fighter command unit um, in the battle uh, in this battle shooting down 126 German machines in only 42 days Czech Sergeant Joseph uh, Frentisek, also in, of 3-3 Squadron, um, was the top scoring pilot with 17 confirmed victories. Air Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding, who led Fighter Command, would later write, had it not been, of course, and, I, and uh, as I read this earlier, had it not been for the magnificent material contributed by the um, Polish squadrons and their unsurpassed gallantry, I hesitate to say that the outcome of the battle would have been the same. So here's the Hurricane. It's a good aircraft. It's maneuverable. It's fast, and it it, it can shoot down and it can challenge German fighter aircraft. Certainly, uh, the Messerschmitt being one, being one of them. On the 31st of August 1940, the squadron was scrambled in the late afternoon on its first operational sortie in a dogfight over Kent. A flight claimed four confirmed and two probable victories over Messerschmitt Bf 109s. Possibly of LG 2 uh, claimants were uh, Squadron Commander Kellett, uh, Kellett F uh, Flight Operator uh, Hindenburg, and PO, Fer PO Ferrick and Squadron uh, Karubin. These were the men that were engaged in this. During the, the 2nd of September 1940, the squadron was scrambled three times. On the last scramble, P.O. Uh, Ferrick shot down a BF-109 and then made a forced landing near Dover, while former Czechoslovak Air Force pilot Sergeant Joseph um, Frentisek claimed a BF-110 aircraft, which is a, the two-engine fighter. Um, the following day over Dover, um, Frentisek claimed his second victory with a total of 17 victories he was the top scoring allied fighter pilot during the battle of britain on fifth on the 5th of september nine number th 303 squadron hurricanes intercepted a german bombing formation escorted by bf 109s fighter aircraft with the poles claiming five bf 109s and three junkers ju 88s for one loss um P.O. Lakowski, who bailed out, of course, and that was one of the, for one loss, he bailed out wounded. On the 6th of September 1940, nine hurricanes were scrambled towards incoming bomber formations. However, during the climb, they were bounced uh, by BF 109s of JG 27 of the Luftwaffe. Um, <clears throat> squadron leader uh, Kesnovetsky, uh Kesnovetsky, sorry, was um, severely burned and three other hurricanes were damaged. The squadron claimed five BF 109s, uh, JG 27 and JG 52, a Donair 17 bomber, and a Heinkel HU 111. FO uh, Flight Officer uh, Witold Urbanowicz uh, was appointed as acting squadron leader. <clears throat> On the 7th of September 1940, the German Air Force, uh, German Air Offensive switched to the London Docks. And that's the third, um, that is the third stage of the, uh, the attacks 
um, for the plans for, for um, uh, the Battle of Britain and came in, in five different waves, um, five different phases. This is phase three. Um, number 303 Squadron was success successfully uh, vectored towards the incoming bomber streams and claimed 12 DO-17s and two BF-109s with PO uh, Zumbach, PO Furek, and Sergeant uh, Zaposkino and Sergeant uh, Witzowicz all scoring double victories. So the, this is just some of the more... Um, so I don't want to read it all, but I want to read some of it. This is day after day after day. Squ of course, they are scrambled by the doubting system. They're warned um, to scramble, and they get in, they take off, uh, full loaded, fully fueled, hopefully, and ready to, and they're going after and shooting these guys down as they're coming in. And uh, this is going on day after day, month after month while losing numerous pilots but take uh, but also claiming heavy losses at 15 at 1600 hours on the 11th of september 1940 the squadron attacked a bomber formation south of london flight officer uh german uh sabroneski uh was fatally wounded by a return fire while sergeant uh Wurzowitz, uh, Wurzowitz, um shot down two Messerschmitt BF-110s uh, before being shot down and killed. The pilots claimed two BF-110s, one BF-109 and three DL-17s and four HE-111s. Here we have a Heinkel HE-111 and it has crashed in England territory, English territory. So, um, 312 Squadron, this is the Czechoslovak Squadron. 312 Czechoslovak Squadron used Hawker Hurricane and Supermarine Spitfire aircraft as well. Um, it was formed, uh, was formed of two, tra uh, sorry, it formed of two transports, that's right, which arrived in Great Britain uh, from North Africa. Um, in July and August 1940. Its basis what basis was formed in the Czechoslovak depot uh, in Korsford in September 1940 of pilots with combat experience in France. After the war in September 1945, it flew from uh, Risen in Prague to the airport in uh, Plana. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, that's, yeah, Bubachovic. Um, where it created the second air division uh, with air regiments four and five uh, from 3rd of March 1948. It bore the honorary title of Airman <coughs> uh, Airman of Elos Vitsetko. So during World War II, it carried out 17,472 combat sorties with a total time of 10,300 and 64 operating hours. It shot down 14 planes with certainty, nine probably, nine probably, and uh, damaged one enemy aircraft. During this time, it lost 17 pilots. Of these, one was a Brit, and six were, and uh, six of their own were captured. So this is uh, one of the squadrons that participated in, of course. Um, um, in the Battle of Britain from in uh, in July uh, July or in August 1940. So here we have the basis of 312 Squadron, and this is the emblem. There's numerous bases there, and a lot of these bases are are um, so the Fighter Command Detachment, which are you can see those um, the those triangles of their Fighter Command Detachments. And then, of course, the, the dots are fighter operate, command operational bases. And um, these are ready to, these bases, these men are ready to, in a moment's notice. And a lot of these are in the southern part of England. These are the guys who are defending England from uh, the Luftwaffe and its continuous attacks. 
So another number 11 group is a very big, uh, it's a very big, uh, fighter group that is defending, um, <clears throat> it is def it's defending London and defending southern England. Uh, the 10 group here um, is on the, as you can see, it's on the west, whereas 11 group is in charge of defense of London. So HQ Fighter Command, it's Stenmore, and then they have um, numerous bases here, one at Canterbury, uh, Hawking and 600 Squadron at Manston, um, 602 Squadron here, uh, 601 Squadrons here and along the coast, and a squadron at, at Croydon near London. And uh, <clears throat> so we have the um, 32 and 610 Squadrons. These squadrons are all under the number 11 air group. <clears throat> So these are the fighter command group and section boundaries, airfields and squadrons. This is during this is during the major um, operations of the Battle of Britain at the 18th of August. This is the 18th of August, 1940. And 12 group is up in uh, higher up and low to mid level England, and is controlled controlling that uh, in, in charge of that territory. So the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe commands um, indecision. Uh, sorry, I'm tongue twisted tonight. The high commands uh, indecision over which aim to pursue um, aims at which to pursue was reflected in shifts in Luftwaffe strategy. Their air war doctrine of concentrated close air support of the army at the battlefront succeeded in the Blitzkrieg offenses against Poland, Denmark, Norway, the Low Countries, and certainly France but incurred significant losses as well. The Luftwaffe now had to establish or restore bases in the conquered territories and rebuild their strength. In June 1940, they began re regular armed reconnaissance flights and sporadic um, nuisance raids of one or a few bombers, both day and night. These gave crews practice in navigation and avoiding air defenses and set off air raid uh, alarms which disturbed civilian morale. Similar nuisance raids continued throughout the battle in, into late 1940, even after the, the main battle of Britain. Scattered naval mine laying uh, sorties began at the outset and increased gradually over the battle period. Goring's operational directive of 30th of June ordered destruction of the RAF as a whole, including uh, the aircraft industry, which, uh, with the aims of ending RAF bombing raids on Germany and fa and facilitating attacks on ports and storage in the Luftwaffe blockade of Britain, <clears throat> attacks on chapel uh, on channel shipping in the in the Canal Kampf began on 4th of July and were formalized on 11th July in order to in. in in an order by Hans um, just just Chonik, which uh, added the arms industry as a target. On the 16th um, July, Directive Number 16 ordered preparation for Operation Sea Line, and on the next day, the Luftwaffe was ordered to stand by in full readiness. Goring met his air fleet commanders, and on the 24th July, issued tasks and goals of gaining air superiority, protecting the army and navy if invasion went ahead, and attacking the Royal Navy's ships as well as continuing the blockade. Once the RAF had been defeated, Luftwaffe bombers were to move forward beyond London without the need of, uh, for a fighter escort, destroying military and economic targets. And that was risky, of course, because if they had no, they had gunners, um, of course, they had their machine gunners, MG-34s and whatnot, in uh, the, their tail gun positions and in the sides of the bombers and then, of course, in the front. But they could only do so much. They didn't have the maneuverability that uh, fighter escorts did. And they were more, much more vulnerable as they entered over English airspace without fighter escort. 
At a meeting on the 1st of August, the command reviewed plans produced by each fighter corps, um, each air corps, with uh, deferring proposals for targets including whether to bomb airfields, but failed to focus priorities. Intelligence reports gave Goring the impression that the RAF was almost defeated. Um, the intent was that uh, the intent was that raids would attract fighter squadrons for the Luftwaffe to shoot down. Um, on the 6th of August, he finalized plans for this operational Operation Eagle attack, or Kesselring, Spear, and Stumpf, um, destruction of our uh, fighter command across the south of England, was to take four days with lightly escorted small bomber raids, leaving the main fighter force free to attack RAF fighters. Bombing of military and economic targets was then to systematically uh, extend up to the Midlands until daylight attacks could proceed unhindered over the whole of Britain. Bombing of London was to be held back while these nighttime destroyer attacks pr uh, proceeded over other urban areas. Then in uh, culmination of the, of the campaign, a major attack on the capital was intended to cause a, uh, a crisis when refugees fled London just as the Operation Sea Lion invasion was to begin. <clears throat> With hopes fading for the possibility of invasion, on the 4th of September, Hitler organized, um, sorry, Hitler authorized a main focus on day and night attacks on tactical targets with London as the main target. And that's um, phase four, the directly, uh, phase, late phase three and phase four of uh, the Battle of Britain in what the British called the Blitz. With increasing difficulty in defending bombers uh, in day in day raids, um, the Luftwaffe shifted to a strategic bombing campaign of night raids, aimed to overcome British resistance um, by damaging infrastructure and food stocks through intentional terror bombing of civilians, um, and they, of course, they did that, but it was not sanctioned but it certainly was done. This is a German photograph of a Heinko HE 111 dropping its bombs I think over London over, or over Dover, one of the major cities. So a uh, regrouping of Luftwaffe and uh, Luft, Luft, what they call Luftflotten. The Luftwaffe uh, was forced to regroup after the Battle of France into three Luftflotten uh, air fleets on Britain's southern and northern flanks. With Fort 2 commanded by General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring was responsible for the bombing of southern England and the London area. With Fort 3 under Field Marshal uh, Field, uh, General Field Marshal Hugo Speer uh, targeted uh, the West Country, Wales, the Midlands and Northwest England. With Fort 5 led by General Albert uh, Hans Jürgen Stumpf from his headquarters in Norway targeted the north of England and Scotland as the battle progressed. Command responsibility shifted as the battle progressed, command responsibility shifted with, with, uh, with foot three taking more responsibility for the nighttime blitz attacks while the main daylight operations fell upon Lifflet two's shoulders. So, uh, so ring shoulders uh, took the main um, daylight raids. Um, initial Luftwaffe estimates were that it would take four days to defeat the RAF fighter command in southern England. Four days. This would be followed by a four-week offensive during which the bombers and long-range fighters would destroy all military installations throughout the country and, ha and wreck the British aircraft industry. The campaign was planned to begin with attacks on airfields near, near the coast, which was phase one, gradually moving inland to attack the ring of sector of airfields defending London. And that's all part of uh, number 11th um, air group that defended that um, of the Royal Air Force. Later reassessments gave the Luftwaffe five weeks 
from 8th of August to September 15th to establish temporary air superior order over England. To achieve this goal, fighter command had to be destroyed either on the ground or in the air. Yet the Luftwaffe had to be able to preserve its own strength to be able to support the invasion. This meant that the Luftwaffe had to maintain a high kill ratio over the RAF fighters. The only alternative to the goal of air superiority was a terror bombing campaign aimed at the civilian population. But this was considered a last resort and it was at this stage expressed it was expressly forbidden by Hitler that didn't last that long <clears throat> so here is uh, oh yes. I think it's in Polish or Czech here's okay we'll foot two um, here it's Kessel ring we'll foot three here which uh, which is in charge of uh, attacking areas of 11 group and as well as 10 group. And here you can see 12 group up here in midsection, 13 group, uh, the Royal uh, Fighter Command, uh, which would be up northern England. And uh, with foot five, I think it was, what is it, Stumpf that is in charge of up here and attacking with foot five. Um, <coughs> The Stumpfer, yeah. Luftwaffe formations employed a loose section of two nicknamed Rotpack, uh, based on a leader, Rottenfuhrer, Fold. Uh, so that's the formations of fighters, uh, their strategy. Fold at a distance of about 200 meters by his wingmen, nicknamed Rottenhund, uh, Pack Dog, or um, Kachmarek who also flew slightly higher and was uh, trained always to stay with his leader. With more room between them, both pilots could spend less time maintaining uh, formation and more time looking around and covering each other's blind spots. Attacking aircraft could be sandwiched between the two 109s. The rot allowed, for, allowed the rotten fear to concentrate on getting kills but few wingmen had the chance, leading to some resentment in the lower ranks where it was felt that the high scores came at their expense. Two sections were usually teamed up uh, into uh, a squirm, um, a storm, sorry, where all the pilots could watch um, what was happening around them. Each swarm in a staffel uh, flew. Uh, at a staggered height, at staggered heights, right, and uh, with about 200 meters of room between them, making the formation difficult to spot at longer ranges and allowing for a great deal of flexibility. By using a tight cross over turn, a squirm uh, could quickly change direction and they could turn together. The BF-110s adopted the same swarm formation as the 109s, but were seldom able to use this to the same advantage. They were bigger and heavier. The BF-110s most successful method of attack was the bounce from above. When attacked, um, uh increasingly resorted to forming large uh, defensive circles which each BF-110 guarded the tail of the aircraft ahead of it. Goring ordered that they be renamed offensive circles in a vain bid to improve um, rapidly declining morale. These conspic um, conspicuous formations were often successful in attracting RAF fighters that were sometimes bounced by high-flying BF-109s. This led to the often repeating, repeated misconception that the BF-110s were escorted by BF-109s. So this is some of the strategy behind fighter, uh, the fighter tactics. Dogfighting is, of course, the conception from World War I, where you're trying to uh, keep your nose ahead of the enemy's fighter, um, the enemy fighter, but you're behind him, and you're trying to 
fire your rounds into his wings or into his engine compartment and killing the pilot or destroying the aircraft and that uh, that meaning a kill so this is uh, just another uh, more complicated example of that um, the rock pack um, of course the fighters would turn and would have to turn together and then be able to sandwich enemy aircraft in between them and uh, and so it was um, in this kind of a concept like a look down shoot down kind of scenario or going and then one's guarding your back while you're taking another and 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 then he can take take the other aircraft it's um without uh, some more pictures uh, i'll have to get some more pictures of it <clears throat> wolf alpha tactics were influenced by their fighters the bf-110 proved too vulnerable uh, to be nimble uh, to the nimble uh, single engine RAF fighters. This meant the bulk of fighter escort duties fell on the BF 109. Um, the fighter tactics were then complicated by bomber crews who demanded uh, closer protection. After the hard fought battles of uh, 15th and 18th of August, Goring met with his unit leaders. During this conference, the need for the fighters to meet up on um, meet up on time with the bombers w was stressed. <clears throat> it was also decided that one bomber gr bomber group uh, could only be properly protected by several group and uh, by a several group of 109s um, measurement BF 109s. In addition, Goring stipulated that as many fighters as possible were to be uh, left free for uh, free, uh, free hunts. Uh, a free roving a fighter sweep and proceeded um, a raid to, keep, to try to sweep defenders out of the raid's path. So they would be able to go on their own or and with uh, their either that or with their wingmen and able to probe and uh, attack the defending fighters, which are going to and those British fighters are going to take down the bombers. So they they need to be able to probe and um, try to interfere with that. Um, <clears throat> So the Ju-87 units, uh, the dive bombers, which had suffered heavy casualties, were only to be used under favorable circumstances. In early September, due to increasing complaints from the bomber crews about RAF fighters seemingly able to get um, through the escort screen, Goring ordered um, an increase in close escort duties. Uh, this decision uh, shackled many of the uh, BF 109s um, to the to the bombers, and um, <clears throat> so they were they were meant to be staying with the bombers, and of course that limited their effectiveness to take enemy aircraft down at a longer range. Although they were more successful at protecting the bomber forces, casualties among the fighters mounted primarily because they were forced to fly and maneuver at reduced speeds and alongside the bombers. The Luftwaffe consist consistently varied its tactics in, in its attempts to break through the RAF defenses. It launched many uh, fair jug or free um, free hunts to draw up RAF fighters. RAF fighter controllers were often able to detect these and position squadrons to avoid them. To avoid them, keeping to Dowding's plan to preserve fighter strength for the bomber formations. The Luftwaffe also, um, so that was of course. RAF fighter controllers were often able to detect these formation, uh, these position squadrons, uh, these free, um, these free hunt squadrons, and keeping and and uh, position squadrons to avoid them, uh, to get away from them. Keeping to Dowding's plan uh, to preserve uh, fighter strength uh, for the bomber formations. <clears throat> So they were trying to keep their uh, their fighters away from them, so that they could um, go up and defend, um, well, take down German bombers, but also protect uh, British bombers going out as well. But um, mainly, that was meant to protect um, um, 
British skies from bombers, uh, German bombers from uh, different formations coming in. Um, <clears throat> so the Luftwaffe also tried using small formations of bombers as bait, covering them with large numbers of escorts. This was uh, more successful, but escort duty uh, tied the fighters to the bombers' slow speed and made them more vulnerable. See if you if uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to break this down so you can it's more understandable. Um, the escort duty, of course, uh, it ties fighters down so they can't go as fast and they can't don't have as much airspeed and maneuverability to um, at the time to um, go after incoming uh, fighters, so that they have to um, <clears throat> that basically takes away some of their um, maneuverability and uh, even, of course. And they have to stay. They have to stay within the bombers. They have, not only have to look at shooting down um, enemy aircraft, enemy British aircraft, but they also have to. They're looking to do that, but they also have to stay close to the bomber formation to try to interfere with British um, aircraft trying to shoot down their bombers. So, um, all right. So this is the Messerschmitt Bf One Ten. This aircraft is actually more was more suited to become a, a tactical bomber, uh, a low level bomber, and uh, it was never uh, it was uh, less designed to be a fighter. It was more it was heavier and it was less maneuverable. Of course, with the changes by September, standing tactics for raids, uh, standard tactics for raids had become an amalgam of techniques. Um, the free hunt would proceed the main attack formations um, the bombers would fly at an at uh, an altitude between five to six thousand meters 16 to 20 thousand feet closely escorted by fighters escorts were divided into two parts usually grouping yeah, usually grouping um, some operating in close contact with the bombers and others a few hundred yards away and a little above if the formation was attacked from the starboard, the starboard section engaged the, fight, the attackers. The top section moving uh, to starboard and the port section to the top uh, position. So they basically like a, almost like a squad maneuver. Moving positions, you cover this back while I take on the enemy. So um, if the attack came from the port side, the system was reversed. British fighters coming from the rear were engaged by the rear section, and the two outside sections, uh, similarly moving to the some uh, similarly moving to the rear. If the threat came from above, the top section went into action, while the the side uh, sections gained height uh, to be able to fall RAF fighters down as they broke away. <clears throat> if attacked, all sections flew in defensive circles. These tactics were skillfully evolved and carried out uh, and were difficult to counter for the Royal Air Force to counter. Here's the measurement uh, BF-110 again. The Luftwaffe was ill-served by its lack of military intelligence about the British defenses. The German intelligence services were fractured and plagued by rivalry. Their performance was amateurish. By 1940, there were few German agents operating in Great Britain, and a handful of bungled attempts to insert spies into the country were foiled. As a result of intercepted radio transmissions, the Germans began to realize that the RAF fighters were being controlled from ground facilities. In July and August 1939, for example, the airship Graf Zeppelin, which was uh, packed with equipment for listening in on RAF radio and, D and RDF transmissions, uh, flew around the coast around the coasts of Britain. Although the Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe currently uh, correctly interpreted these new ground control procedures, they were incorrectly assessed 
as being rigid and ineffectual. <clears throat> a British radar system was well known to the Luftwaffe from intelligence gathering before the war, but the highly developed doubting system linked with fighter control had been a well-kept secret. Even when the good information existed, such as a November 1939 Adwer um, assessment of fighter command strengths and capabilities by Abtelung 5, um, it was ignored if it did not match conventional preconceptions. On the 16th of July 1940, Abtelung 5, commanded by um, Oberst, um, Oberst Lieutenant uh, Bebo Schmid, produced a report on the RAF and on Britain's defensive capabilities, which was adopted by the frontline commanders as a basis for their operational plans. One of the most conspicuous uh, failures of the report was the lack of information on the RAF's RDF network and control systems capabilities. It was assumed that the system was rigid and inflexible with RAF fighters being tied to their home bases. <clears throat> An optimistic and, as it turned out, erroneous conclusion reached, and that was the, the supply situation. At present, um, the British aircraft industry produces about 180 to 300 first-line first fighters and 140 first-line bombers a month. In view of the present conditions relating to production, the appearance of raw material difficulties, the disruption of breakdown of production of at factories owing to air attacks, the increased vulnerability to air attack um, owing to the fundamental reorganization of the aircraft industry now in progress, it is believed that for the time being, output will decrease rather than increase. In the event of an intensification of air warfare, it is expected that the present, present strength of the RAF will fall, and this decline will be aggravated by the continued decrease in production. And that was, of course, completely wrong, because production dramatically increased as more factors and more factors were coming up alongside in England, and of course, 300 became 400, 400 became 500, and uh, certainly they were producing actually more aircraft than the Luftwaffe was at the time uh, during the full scale of the battle. The Luftwaffe was much more, much uh, better prepared for the task of air sea, um, air sea rescue than the RAF. And air sea rescue, if pilots are shot down, then um, it is imperative that, of course, being rescued is, uh, of course, being rescued is paramount um, to rescue pilots that are well trained and well equipped. To um, and if, but if something happens, of course, it, they need to be picked up and or rescued either at sea or at land um, before they are captured. Uh, the Germans were much better at this than the RAF, uh, specifically. Uh, tasking uh, the season uh, Sindot Dinst uh, unit equipped with about 30 Heinkel HE-59 float planes um, with picking up downed aircrew from the North Sea, English Channel and the Dover Straits. In addition, Luftwaffe aircraft were equipped with life rafts and aircrew uh, were provided with um, satchets uh, of a chemical called uh, uh, called fluorescent, which uh, on reacting with water created a large, easy to see bright green patch. And of course, that's fluorescent light. Um, German um, German crews were equipped with that. In accordance with the Geneva Convention, the HE 59s were unarmed and painted white with civilian registration markings and red crosses. Nevertheless, RAF aircraft attacked these aircraft as some were escorted by BF 109s. After single HE 109, uh, after single HE 59s were forced to land on the sea by RAF fighters on 1st and 9th July, respectively, a controversial order was issued to the RAF on 
13th of July. This stated that from 20th July, uh, sea not uh, sea not don't sea not dense aircraft were to be shot down. One of the reasons given by Churchill was we did not recognize this means of rescuing enemy pilots so they could come and bomb our civil population again. All German air ambulances uh, were uh, were forced down are going to be for, uh, forced down or shot down by our fighters on definite orders approved by the war cabinet. And of course that was approved. Um, the British also believed that the their air crews would report on convoys. So that's why they wanted them shot down or forced down. The air ministry issued uh, a communicate to the German government on 14th of July that Britain was unable to unable However, to grant immunity to such aircraft flying over areas in which operations are in progress on land or at sea, or approaching British or Allied territory, or territory in British occupation, or British or Allied ships. Ambulance aircraft which do not comply with the above will do so at their own risk and peril and be shot down. This uh, concludes uh, part two of this presentation on the Battle of Britain. Uh, so part three, we'll talk about the doubting system and, of course, the Blitz and get more detail. I'll get into more detail of the five phases of the Battle of Britain. All right. Thank you very much. Aaron Bulma, Military Specialist for Carlton County.